Have you ever seen a traffic sign that shows a picture of a truck rolling over in steep turns and asked yourself why they chose to go with a picture of a truck uh, and maybe not a car? Have you ever noticed that uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to control your car at uh, higher speeds uh, and why everyone is told to drive below a speed limit that is deemed safe? Uh, so hello people, uh, my name is Aditya and welcome to Vehicle Dynamics Lectures. In these lectures, uh, we'll figure out answers to these questions uh, and more. So uh, what is vehicle dynamics? Vehicle dynamics uh, at a high level is simply the study of vehicles in motion. Um, in a bit more detail, let's say you know your uh, vehicle's position and velocity at some time k. In other words, you know your vehicle state at that time k, which is denoted by x uh, subscript k. Uh, let's say your vehicle is being subjected to a bunch of inputs that are both internal to it and external to it. The field of vehicle dynamics allows you to predict what that next state xk plus 1 would be um, given your previous state xk and all the inputs it's uh, subjected to. And it tells you this answer with a decent amount of confidence. Now, uh, let's try to see what some of these uh, inputs look like. Common examples of uh, internal inputs include things like brakes, uh, throttle, and steering. Now, uh, these are essentially all the uh, controls available to you as a driver. And uh, many of us have very strong mental models of how uh, these inputs affect the behavior of our cars. Um, so now, what are some examples of external inputs? Wind, for example, is a great example. You might have noticed that if you're driving down a highway and if it's particularly gusty, it becomes hard to keep your car on the road. In other words, wind acts as an external input affecting the behavior of your car. Other examples of external inputs include road undulations, which in turn include things like potholes and speed bumps. Now that we know what vehicle dynamics is at a high level, let's try to see how it's uh, commonly categorized. Now, uh, note that this categorization is by uh, no means universal. It's uh, honestly how I, I think about the subject and uh, what makes sense to me. With that uh, disclaimer out of the way, uh, let's dive right in. Vehicle dynamics is uh, divided in two main categories. Uh, first is modeling and the other is uh, data analysis. Uh, I'm sorry, the first is modeling and data analysis and the other is design. Uh, now, note that these two categories are uh, not mutually exclusive. Modern vehicle design uh, heavily leverages the insights provided by modeling and data analysis to make more informed design choices. Um, let's try to grasp, grasp this a little bit better and see how this might work with a toy example. Let's say we're tasked with a design problem where our goal is to design a ball such that its uh, velocity at impact when drop from a height h is as low as is possible. Essentially, we're trying to minimize impact velocity. Now, like with pretty much everything else in life, here too, we will have to work around a bunch of constraints. Now, what are these constraints? The first constraint we have is machining. So we're given a machine to work with, meaning there's not much we can play around with things like surface roughness. We are given a material to work with, there are a bunch of constraints on dimensions and mass. Now, before we delve into this example, bear in mind that the reason we're running through this exercise is to build intuition on how similar tasks are approached in the field of vehicle dynamics. In other words, the hope is that once we run through this example and in the future when we study vehicle dynamics concepts, we'll be able to see how we can leverage those concepts to de design better vehicles. Now, uh, because I'm a mechanical engineer by degree and uh, we mechanical engineers love our uh, first principles based models, let's get started with that. Um, to make sure we're, on, we're all on the same page, let's first nail down our uh, syntax and notations. Uh, to start off, um, Z will represent our vertical height. So that will represent the vertical height of the ball as we go through uh, the derivations. Z uh, dot, which is Z with a single dot on top, uh, represents the uh, derivative of um, our position Z with respect to time. 
In other words, it's the vertical velocity of the ball. Uh, in that similar way, in Z with two dots on top called as uh, Z double dot is the second derivative of Z with respect to time, uh, also known as vertical acceleration. With that, we've uh, sort of uh, defined our uh, state variables. Now on to parameters. Um, M represents mass, rho, uh, the Greek symbol represents um, air density. A, that is capital A, represents uh, frontal area. So for example, if you have a ball uh, with radius r, uh, 4 pi r square would be the uh, total surface area or the total external surface area of the ball. Pi r square would be the frontal area of the ball or the cross-sectional area of the ball. Uh, Cd uh, represents the coefficient of drag. And last but not the least, we have our g, or uh, our lowercase g, which represents acceleration due to gravity. Um, now, let's look at all the forces involved. So if we draw an FPD, we can see that our ball is being pulled down uh, by gravity. So there's mg acting downwards. And there's obviously air drag resisting its motion. So the air drag would act upwards. Um, to make sure we're on the same page with regards to our sign conventions, let's say Z um, is uh, positive pointed in the upward direction. And uh, if we put all this together and write down our equations of motion, um, balancing out forces, we get that our mass times vertical acceleration, which is mz double dot, is uh, equal to uh, minus mg plus air drag. Now, uh, here for air drag, we'll substitute um, a common drag equation, which is a simplified uh, formula to represent air drag. And uh, when we put all of that together and uh, do a little bit of simplification, essentially just canceling out mass terms from both sides, uh, we, we get an expression that boils down uh, and tells us what the vertical acceleration of the ball is. Um, let's take a moment to inspect this equation. What does the left-hand side tell us? The left-hand side tells us that this is the a vertical acceleration of the ball. In other words, this is how fast my ball's velocity changes. And I also know that my ball starts at zero velocity. So if I can try and minimize this at every timestamp, I am essentially, um, I'm essentially um, de decreasing impact velocity. Now, how do we actually go about doing this? The answer to that lies on the right-hand side. Uh, so the first term on the right is minus g. That is essentially acceleration due to gravity. Now, that's not something we can play around with. That's an intrinsic property of Earth. Uh, this leaves us with the next, um, this leaves us with air drag. And that's pretty much the only thing we can play around with here. So let's inspect the air drag um, expression and go through each of those parameters one by one. Let's start with rho. Uh, rho is air density. And again, that's not really something we can change. So that remains a constant. That is out of picture. Next is uh, CD, which is coefficient of drag. Coefficient of drag is largely a function of the external shape of an object. And because our constraints mandate that the ball is a sphere, uh, that's, this again is not something we can mess around with. This essentially leaves us with two parameters, the frontal area of the ball and the mass. And we can see that if we increase the frontal area and decrease the mass, um, we should be able to increase air drag. And of course, increasing air drag will help us reduce impact velocity. Now, armed with this piece of information, uh, what concrete steps can we actually take in designing our ball? Now, at first glance, um, it might seem like increasing the diameter of the ball might just work because that increases surface area. However, there is a catch. Frontal area is directly proportional to the square of the ball's diameter, but our mass is directly proportional to the diameter's cube. This is, of course, for a solid ball. So, naively increasing diameter is not going to help. This hopefully rings a bell in your head and you realize that making the ball hollow might be the trick. So a hollow ball that just about meets our constraints uh, would be the design we converge on. Now uh, we've arrived at this design by using uh, first principles based modeling. Let's see if we can glean the same insights uh, using data. Now let's try to get a flavor of how uh, we might arrive at the same conclusions had we uh, taken the data out. So um, if we need to do some data analysis, the prerequisite is uh, 
pretty obviously data. Uh, and to collect the data, we will need to uh, attach accelerometers onto the many balls we'll be uh, collecting data from. And uh, why are we doing this? Like, why are we attaching accelerometers to many balls? Um, the idea is to properly span our search space. That is to make sure we have a whole host uh, or a variety of balls, that is balls with different outer diameters, inner diameters, and mass. Um, and now once we run all our experiments, which uh, literally entails dropping these balls from a building of height h, uh, the next steps would look something like this. We will uh, create a table, noting down all our accelerometer readings for each ball, and then uh, forward integrate um, these acceleration readings to find out the velocity of impact. Um, now let's try uh, drawing some plots. Because uh, there are a few variables, let's um, change them one at a time to make sure we understand the effect uh, our given variable of interest has uh, on our goal, which to uh, recap is minimize impact velocity. So uh, for our first plot, let's plot impact velocity on the y-axis and uh, inner ball diameters on the x-axis for a given outer diameter. So we're keeping our outer diameter constant and varying inner ball diameters. If we've done our experiments right, uh, we should be seeing some negative correlation between the two variables. Uh, that is, when we increase inner diameter, we should expect to see our impact velocity drop. Now, um, if we do the exact opposite, that is, keep our inner diameter constant and vary our outer diameter, hopefully uh, we end up with a graph that shows a positive correlation between the two variables. That is, when we increase outer diameter, we should expect to see our impact velocity increase. Um, now, the plots put together tell us that we have to be hollow. <laughs> Just so that I'm not misconstrued, I don't mean as a human being, uh, but in the way we, you know, design these balls. So to summarize, um, we have gleaned the same insights on how to design a ball, uh, that is to achieve our design objective, both via the modeling route and also the data analysis route. And now uh, to wrap up this intro lecture, let's summarize what we have learned. We have uh, understood what vehicle dynamics is at a very high level. And uh, at a high level, it's nothing but the study of vehicles in motion. Uh, we now know the main categories in which the subject can be subdivided. And uh, we've also learned how design uses insights provided by modeling and data to make more informed choices. And with that, this uh, video comes to an end. Uh, thank you for watching and hopefully you've learned something in the last uh, 10 or so minutes. If you like the video, uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Also, I would love to hear all of your feedbacks in the comments section. It will help me make these videos uh, more useful to you as a viewer. Thank you.